Well, I'm glad you're with me today for something that I love all the time. It's called On Demand. Man, let me tell you, this is going to be a great sermon. Because today I'm going to talk about living and loving people, listen to this now, with different political views. How do you live with and love people who don't think like you? And some of you say, well, I don't agree with that, Pastor Rick. I think everybody needs to agree with me because I'm a problem. I'm a Republican. And if truly godly people are always Republicans, it's them liberals. <laughs> and then the Democrats say the same thing about you. Oh boy, how can you be a Republican? Well, in history, both have been off at some point in their life. But today, I want to take on some things today. I, I really do. I want to take on a couple of issues that I think are really important. And I don't think you want to miss it. So sit back, get ready. You asked for this. It's on demand. It's for you. Enjoy today's message. Living and loving people who have a different opinion. Can you deal with that? Stay with me. We'll talk about that. Stay right there. I'm going to talk today about voting and politics, but I want to specifically deal with one simple question. What is your plan for dealing with people that don't agree with you? What do you plan to do after you've laid out your speech, you've laid out your plans, and somebody says, I don't agree? And voting in politics, that's often common. But I think that sometimes we're not prepared for that. Especially Christians, sometimes we, you know, we feel like, you know, the Lord gave us a word and some of you are so fixed on what you believe in this area. And you've got a couple of Bible verses you feel fit and you've got a couple of, you know, convictions and some big hard issues that you stand on. Abortion's one of them. Gay rights is one of them. All these other things. And I'm going to talk about a lot of that today. Bearing arms. Some of you have that's your issue. You have a lot of thoughts and a lot of convictions that that steer your your personal voting preference. And if you're not careful, you don't really care about anybody else's preference or anybody else's view. And you can get to the point that you really just kind of feel like it's all about you. It's all about how you see the world, how you feel the world should be. And I use the word in the second sermon in this series called triumphalism. There's a big word, triumphalism. There it is. And that word means basically to feel as if you should take over politically and you should have this triumphant or this dominant position over people. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous when you become the kind of person who doesn't listen to anybody. You don't care what anybody else says. The poor guy that's on the farm who's trying to get his you know, farm taken care of but feels like he's not getting the right kind of trade deals. Or the, or the, or the guy that lives in the inner city that's struggling. Do you care about what black people think? Do you care about what white people think? Do you care about anybody besides you? Do you care about Hispanics? You know, do you understand the power of voting and how each person has a right to stand where they stand and say, I, I vote based on these facts and that you don't have the right to take that from them. And what I'm really concerned about is churches are doing that these days. They're taking it upon themselves to define for people what they should think and how they should vote and how they should see the world. And maybe you feel that's your assignment. Maybe you feel that's what you should do. But just for the sake of argument, <laughs> since you're watching me today, in the Bible days, nobody voted. In the Bible days, the king ruled. The one with the biggest gun ruled. No democracy, no voting rights, no woman women rights. Slavery was common everywhere. It was a mess. And it wasn't God's best plan. America's a big experiment. And I talked about that in the first sermon. You might want to go back and listen to the first sermon in this series. And I talked about our history in 1776, how that all of a sudden now you had this new governing policy, something that was different than anything they experienced in England. Now they had this new ability, this new responsibility to choose. But the problem was they didn't choose fairly. They didn't give women rights for 144 years. They didn't give blacks rights. They put them in slavery. And that's not right. That's not friendly. And the Indians were slaughtered. There were a lot of things that were done in the infancy of our, our nation, in the immaturity of that season in our life, that really weren't wise nor helpful. And some of the residue of that still lives today. Now, I, I understand that you can't go back and change all that, but you can make it different today. And you can, you can at least take a step back and not try to force people to give you their voting right. I pastor a church with diverse people. I've got Democrats and I've got Republicans in my church. And the Democrats say, wait a minute, Republicans. And the Republicans say, wait a minute, Democrats, that. <laughs> and sometimes they hide from each other. Sometimes they don't want to talk about it. But sometimes they have the courage to share ideas. And I think it's healthy. I think it's healthy to share ideas in a way that's safe 
and mature. Sometimes you may, somebody may say something that might help you see the light or at least be more sensitive to an issue. Bipartisanship is important. A house divided can't stand. This is all bad when we're divided. This is all bad when you pick a side and when you don't care about me, which, which let me just digress a moment and say a little bit more here. Uh, this whole COVID-19 thing, this whole thing about, you know, you could give it to somebody. All that is something we all should be united around. We should all care about each other. We should care about how we can infect other people and change their lives forever and kill people. This is kill my Lord, it's killed more people in the shortest span than any war we've ever had in the history of this country. Over 220, 30,000 as of this count, close to 230,000 or more. That is amazing. In, in, in less than a year, you've seen, less than 10 months, you've seen that many people die. It's just tragic. And, and what are we doing? Arguing about wearing a mask, arguing about whether or not it's somehow a symbol of something, a weakness. And pastors are quoting Bible verses, you know, God hadn't given me the spirit of fear and all that. Now, that's not, this is not the time for that. This is not where we need to be as a family, as a people. We need to be with each other. I need you, you need me. And there's something about wrapping your arms around that, laying down your swords for a minute, laying down your arguments for a minute. You're sitting there arguing. I talked about this last week. You're sitting there arguing with you know, each other about what CNN said. Well, CNN said this, and CNBC, and MSNBC, and Fox said, and everybody's arguing over stuff that does not advance us as a people. What we need to work on is making sure that another 200,000 people don't die. We need to work on that because, listen to me carefully, it could be somebody you love. It could be somebody you love. I shared last week about a friend who is disabled so far because of this disease. I've, I've done funerals. I've, I've done too many funerals. I've heard too many stories every week, every week all over the country, young and old, babies, infants. It's really tragic to me. And what's really sad is Christians aren't uniting around resolving it. They're feeding into the fray. If you looked online, the arguments, the comments, the back and forth and the vitriol is just horrible. That is not God's will. That's not representing Jesus well. And it will not help us win people to Christ. And here is what I want to say before I get to the text. The long term danger for the uh, danger of all this is people will, will remember it. You've been trying to get people saved in your family for a long time. You've been trying to get people to come to your church. You've been trying to get people to love Jesus. You've been telling people that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You've been telling people that you are, you're full of the Holy Ghost and the power of God. Well, how could you be so full of God and not care about infecting somebody? How could you be so full of God and not care about the things that the society needs you to care about? We need to fight together, not fight each other. And so that's why I've been talking about this. The series has been pretty powerful. It's been important for me. And I've shared my heart out of love for you. And I want you to, with me to join me in a review. We talked the first sermon about the truth about voting in politics. Responsibility of governing. That's what we talked about. And we shared with you something that it was very simple. A very historical video that talked about how we as a country started as a democracy in 1776. It's a good sermon to go back and listen to. The second sermon, we talked about triumphalism. This whole idea of taking over. I mentioned that a minute ago. This idea of taking over and this whole idea of controlling people. You've got to be careful that you're not focused on dominating instead of loving the world. Then thirdly, we talked about lying. Our big word was lying. It was all about lying. It was all about lying and, and not being honest and not being willing to say. If this is not true, it's not true. Let me just say this to you. If you love a candidate and they're not truthful, whether they be a Republican, Democrat, the president, whoever it is, if it's not true, then it's not true. That's all there is. Let me help my candidate by challenging them to tell the truth. But I don't help anybody when I endorse things that are not true. Attitudes that aren't true. I need to be careful about that. We all need to be servant leaders. Jesus said the greatest among you shall be your servant, not your boss, not your dictator, not your intimidator but the person that cares for you. And I understand you got to be tough and fight hard. I get that. But we don't have to be... See, there's a word I almost said. We don't have to be mean. We don't have to be mean to each other. 
It can be tough. We can say what we feel. You can say that with love, but you need to say it. And I think one of the mistakes the church has made is it's not challenged. It's not challenged the truth. It's not said this is wrong. This is not the way you behave. This is not what you do. And I think that for those of you that are fans of the president, you do him a favor by telling him the truth. If you're a fan of the senators, you do them a favor by telling them the truth. If they're out of line, if they're out of order, if it's your candidate, Democrat or Republican, you do them a favor and you show love by saying that's not accepted. Now, you may like the policy, but you need to learn to draw the line. Look, success at all costs is not success. Success at any means is not is not true success. That's compromise. And sometimes the problem we have is we have lost our testimony and we're no longer um, respected because we didn't stand up and they'll remember these days. And it's really important that we band together and do that. The fourth thing we want to talk about today is dealing with people, loving and living with people with different political views. How do you love and live with people who have different views than you? Now, if you're married, you get it already. <laughs> you get it already. Because if, you, if you're married, if you've got kids, you know that's part of life. There is always going to be somebody with a different viewpoint. So let me ask you this question. What is your strategy for dealing with people who see the world differently? What is your strategy for that? What is your plan? And you need, you need a strategy. And I, I've learned that in, as, you know, as a father raising kids that you know, they didn't always agree with me. And don't still always agree, even though I'm right. But they don't always agree with me. And then I have to learn to negotiate that and try to work it out and try to talk a little bit, negotiate. And there's something healthy about that. Second side, what I call a side question. Are you clear that your choices could have a positive or a negative effect on others? Are you clear about that? Did you know this? It can defile many people. The Bible uses that term many people, not just a few. The Bible says, I'm going to read you the verse. It can defile many people if not managed properly. If you don't learn how to respond and handle differences, if you don't learn how to manage your life in a positive way, you can damage people. Here's what the Bible said, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile a man. Now, this is this is the NIV version. The King James version is kind of poetic. You know, pursue peace with all men, it said that your job should be to pursue, chase after peace. Your goal should be to try to find a way. You got to find a way. And sometimes it's finding a way. It's not easy. It's not simple. But you've got to find a way to make this work. And that takes determination. There are three positive goals I want you to see in this text. And then there are three negative concerns. Here are the positive goals. Number one, make every effort, he says, to live in peace with everyone. That's your first goal. Make every effort. And literally every effort. Number two, watch this. Make every effort to be holy or set apart for God in your lifestyle. You want to make sure That your life is set apart. Holiness without any man. The word holy, the word basically has to do with being set apart. That I'm not like everybody else. Be different. Be different than those on your job who are entering in all this bitter bickering. Be different. Be set apart. Thirdly, make every effort to not defile others because of the eternal consequences. Don't you allow yourself to to do that. The long-term consequences are pretty profound. If If you don't, see that you can impact people and your choices, your, you're going around spreading attitudes and tones, and, and, uh, and especially in this political environment, that, that don't help. It's, it, it's, it's one thing to disagree. It's another thing to be um, just absolutely toxic and poisonous in your attitude. And then they used to always say, what would Jesus say? Jesus disagreed with people. Well, wait a minute, Pastor Rick. Now, he turned the tables over. He told them they were snakes and vipers. Yeah, he did. He did. There's a time for that. But that wasn't his norm. This is becoming the norm. This is becoming in every verse in your life, in every chapter of your communication. 
You can pull out one chapter here and one chapter there. And there were unique moments when that was necessary. But what was powerful was he was telling the truth to people that were leaders. If you want to use that, remember, it. he told people who were leaders that they were out of line. He told people that were leaders. He didn't he didn't let them get away with the way they treated people and the way they treated the poor. He didn't let them get away with it. He didn't let them get away with name calling. He didn't. He challenged them. He said, you, you say one thing, but don't do what you say. And that is the kind of accountability that, that we need to embrace for all parties. Everybody needs to be held to that same standard. Now, there are three negative concerns. He mentioned that some will fall short of the glory of God, which means you won't represent God well. Secondly, some could develop a bitter root. There's a, the King James says it this way, a root of bitterness, that there could be this thing about you that's just bitter and hostile. And now you can't even say Democrat. Democrat. Them Democrats. <laughs> Look at you. With your say Holy Ghost feel full of love of Jesus self. It's just so you can know your love. You, know, you remember 1 Corinthians 13? You can, you can have great gifts and great talents and all of that but have not love, you are a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Remember that? It's in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the way we're communicating, the way we're behaving, is way outside of the bounds of love. And it's infectious. We turn to the next point. That this could become dangerous. Some could ignore the warnings and defile, he said, many. COVID-19 is an example of this. COVID-19 has given us a new meaning. I don't, I don't, I don't, I've, I've tried to figure it out, I, you know, and I, I guess I've come to a conclusion that maybe the problem is the way we think as Christians, that there's something about the way we process, the way we, the way we process things, the way we look at things, that it has, it, it, it it's led to um, <laughs> some dangerous conclusions, some conclusions that I think are unhealthy, that, that make us think in ways that, work against, uh, I almost want to say, common sense, good sense, practical sense, scientific sense. Colds are spread, and we get that. So when people cough, you say, hey, cover your mouth, you're coughing. You know, okay, right. That's one thing, a cold, okay. Uh, leprosy, you know, they used to tell people, you know, when you have a leper, you had to say, when someone came near you, you had to say, leper! You know, the lepers had to say something. They would kill them. You couldn't just walk up on people and um, and just, you know, be a leper and infect people. The, the, why? Here they've said that this disease, COVID-19, at this season is infectious and spreads through the air. And then what you need is a mask. You just need a mask. Now, I just happen to have one with me. So, you know, my, one of my little masks I carry with me. I won't style it for you. But I got I got some black ones. I got some different colors. <laughs> and they said, put it on. When you're talking to people, pretend you might have it until you know you don't. Now, I've been tested twice. I went and got tested, made sure I was fine. And I've, I've kept my six feet. I've done all I can do. Now, when you've done all you can do, that's one thing. There's some people that you've done all you can. And some of you caught it anyway. But, but what you have to understand is you caught it from somebody. If you didn't have it. And you got it. Somebody, somebody gave it to you. Somebody did this. Maybe they don't know they did it. Probably don't know, but they did it. And I'm just saying to myself, why would you take this chance? If meat offend my brother and I won't eat meat while I'm in the world, why would you, why would you not do all you can if you really love people? Love people? I think there's a there's a tragedy when sometimes people forget I am my brother's keeper. I'm responsible for you. And if I can do something simple in this season to protect you, I want to do that. So every day I pretend that I have it. Every day I pretend. Well, I ain't going to pretend that I confess the word of God. I believe the God. The Bible said I'm healed by his stripes. See, that's the problem right there. That's the problem right there. See, you know, 
I understand you want to believe and have faith. Don't cut me off yet. Hold on. Hang with me. There's something about just thinking about what I'm saying. If you're worried about giving somebody a cold, if you're worried about not saying something that's offensive, well, surely you don't want to do anything that could possibly have an outcome of death in somebody's life. Or that could have an outcome where this person that I love, I mentioned the other day, who's home today trying to recover. And I mean, I've seen dozens of people go through this and it's just not fair. The economic damage you cause them. I have a whole, another family just talking the other day, a pastor, his whole family is locked away. Now, that's because somebody gave it to him because he didn't have it. And he went to a church service. And he was masked and they were not. So he had a mask on. Yeah. He had a mask on. But for the season that we're in, if we all mask up, if they had their mask on, I got my mask on. We got double support. You need to do all you can. You need to do all you can. If you say you love people, do your part. Read your verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 again. Work at getting along with each other. And with God. Look at that now. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. This is the message version of the same verse. Work at getting along with each other and with God. Or this is so, so simple. He says, I want you to work at, at work at it. Work at it. I want you to work at this. Then he goes on in verse 15. Make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity or grace. Keep a sharp eye for out for the weeds of bitter discontent, a thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. One little weed can spread all over the place. That's what he's saying. What I'm saying is simple today. It's not complicated, but it often gets lost. It gets lost because somehow we've allowed people to make us feel angry and bitter. And I'm not judging you and saying you're a bad person. I'm simply saying if I love you, I do all I can to protect you because I care about you. The Good Samaritan, remember that? I try to, I try to just show concern. I just do all I can. When I go to the grocery store, I do all I can. I try, I try to wash my hands. I do all I can. And, and I'm learning in this season that sometimes we're not care. We're not caring enough, which brings me to three things you should refuse to do. You ready? Here they go. Number one, refuse to believe in triumphalism. I use that word a lot because I want you to get it. Refuse to believe that you should conquer and dominate and not care. And I don't care. And I that, that don't don't have that spirit. Number two, refuse to allow a root of bitterness to grow in your heart. Don't be bitter towards anybody. I don't want you to be bitter toward any political party or any political person. I don't want you to be bitter toward the president. I don't want you to be bitter toward anybody. Bitterness doesn't help you. And it's not going to help him. It's not going to help us. It's not going to help make things better. Bitterness is not the way to live. Well, I can't help it. Pause, please. Hear me all the way through. It's got to apply to all of us. You didn't tell me. Help me, Temple. All that's going on, you ain't bitter. The Bible said, the one you believe in said, don't let a root of bitterness spring up into you. You know, I, I, tell, I tell my kids this. Don't let somebody pick you up and plant you in some bad soil. Just because somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do or you think that they're out of line, don't you let them pick you up and make you into them. And if you're not careful, you become them being mad with them. Some of you right now, somebody did you wrong and you just is grumpy when you say their name. You just you just shake. <laughs> you sad. That is so sad. Here you are. Oh, this is you one minute. Oh, how you doing? God bless you. Yes. Praise the Lord. God is good. And then you see this person. Oh, there he goes. Yeah. You just get these the fangs. Just. It's like a vampire. You just change like a vampire. You just is holy, holy, holy. All you got to do is say Barbara. You just change right there. <laughs> You're not even nice anymore. If I say Bob or Frank, you, there you go. Wicked, wickedness come out. And it's because you have allowed yourself to be transformed into them. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your, your job is to be different. 
You said you know Jesus. You said you've got the Holy Spirit. You said all that. Nobody, somebody, nobody made you say it. And if it's true, then you're going to have to refuse to be that way. I refuse to be that way. I refuse to hold that grudge. I refuse. I'm not going to dwell on that like that. That's not going to dominate my life and my mind another day in the name of Jesus. Now, that's when you got power. When you can rise up and say, I don't care what flies over my head, birds, flames, whatever can happen in my life. I refuse to allow myself to be dominated by that thought. Some of you have been abused by somebody and they're still abusing you because you think about them every day. You call them every day. Look, you know, they used to say this in the church back in the day when I was a kid. Loose here. You remember that one? <laughs> when they said the devil got you bound up, say loose here, devil. You need to say loose here. I'm not thinking about that, dwelling on that. I'm not going to sit here and become bitter and angry and start looking like it. And there you are trying to shed a love of God with bitterness all over your face. You got to see yourself. You don't look like you're happy. You don't look like the joy of the Lord. You don't look like somebody that, that, that has, a, has a voice for Christ in the world because you're mad at everybody. Preachers are mad. Mad at their members. Don't give nothing. You don't tithe enough. Y'all don't come on to church. You're trying to get them back in the building. They ain't coming. And you're mad with them because they won't come. Where's your faith? Come on in the house of God. Now, I'm, uh, it's, uh, why? Pa pause. Pause, your, pause the button. You mean you mad because they won't come? You mad because they don't, quote, have faith the way you think they need to have faith? I had to pause there, see? I had to pause. In my head, I said something I didn't say out of my mouth. I had to catch myself. I put it on me. I deserve to be by myself if I think like that. If I don't care about you, then you not caring about me is fair. Let me say it again. If I don't care about your health, it's fair for me not to worry about you because, hey, I'm just saying, if you don't care about me, I got to make sure I'm safe. So I got to take care of me. If you don't care about me, I've got to care. Pastor Rick, time out. Question. Are you trying to say that all the churches that are opening up are, don't care about people? Here's what I'm saying. <laughs> Listen carefully. If it's not safe. They shouldn't be opening up. If they are opening up, they need to make sure it's as safe as they can. They need to have distance and they need to make sure that they clean up everything. They need to make sure they sanitize everything. They need to make sure they do all the rules. And see, church people don't always do all the rules. You know what I'm saying? Now, I always say this. Listen carefully. Church people clean over here sometimes, but not over there. The church bathroom is not the neatest bathroom in the world. I'm just saying it's not. The mall is better. It's not always neater. And they don't always do right. They don't always clean it every day, now every week either. A lot of times, okay, I'm just saying, I've been pastoring for 39 years. Now, they clean mine, but we pay for it. We have a whole system. Are you saying yours is perfect? No, but I, we try hard. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying we haven't messed up. We try. I have to get in there. Look, I'm just saying, we as a group aren't the, aren't the neatest people. Now, if you think I'm not making that up, go look at your church and tell me I'm wrong. Email me. Let me know. They're not. And this is something where you've got to, if you're going to go back, you need to go back with all your armor on, helmet, mask, everything, gloves on, and you need to be clear. But see, if you go up in the town, we're going to hug each other. Everybody hugging. Oh, come on. Hug, hug, hug. Flesh see you. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. I ain't got that. I buy Corona. Listen, here's what I'm saying. I want them to put this on the screen. You ready? I want them to write this on the screen for you. You fight the fight you're in, not the fight you want to be in. You fight the fight you are in, not the fight you want to be in. The Bible says sit down and count the cost up to see whether you are able to win or not. You don't just go and pretend that you can win when you don't look at the facts. So please be clear. I'm giving you a list. I got to get out of here. Watch this now. Here we go. Ready? We got to end this. Refuse to be the person who um, <laughs> is bitter. And then the third thing I want to say was this. Refuse to deny people the right to disagree with you. You know, let people disagree with you. Let people say, I don't, I don't agree with you. Let your members stay home if they want to and stream in. Don't be so close to having more than one option. Now, I've got a question for you. What affects you, then, Pastor Rick? Let me switch back to where we were, this issue of, of voting, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about today. Let me give you some final thoughts about this. Because this is where the big disagreements are today. So what's my formula for voting? Here you go. Ready? Number one. 
What personally affects my decision to vote? Ricky Temple. You ready? Here we go. Number one, I sometimes vote for people who do not agree with me if it helps the larger society, if it helps the majority. I vote for people that help the majority, not always people who agree with me. If it's better for everybody else, I, I, I will embrace what's better for the majority. That's my first rule. So, not, so it's not just about what's better for Ricky. It may be better for me financially. I may get, may get a better tax break because I make more money. I may have better opportunities. But that's, that's not what this is about. This is about everybody. It's about the whole house, not just me. Secondly, I sometimes vote for people who are not Christian. That may shock you. You mean you vote for people who don't have the Holy Ghost and save and full of the power of, God, power of God? Yes. This is not a theological vote. Let me say this to you. I'm not voting for a person who's theologically sound. I'm voting for somebody that, 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 that can get the job done, you see. They don't have to be theologically sound. Thirdly, I try to vote for, for the person. Uh, let me hear you. I hear some of you talking to me. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Well, Pastor Rick, wouldn't it be nice if they were? Yeah, it'd be nice. It'd be nice. It'd be nice if they were a believer, but, but, it, but that's not my, my, my reason for voting for them. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, if a Muslim wanted to run, I'd vote for him. If he was a good Muslim, he did a good job, and he's going to do a good job, fine. I'm not going to be, maybe join him because I'm obviously a Christian. But, but I'm not going to say no to him because, because he's, he's not a, he's a, he's a non-church person. If he doesn't go to church, I'm not going to say no because he doesn't go to church. This is not a theological vote. I'm not voting for his theology. Can I get you the third one? Watch this now. I try to vote for the person who is the best servant leader. That's big for me. The Bible says this, that the greatest among you become your servant. For me, that's a big test. I need to see that you are a servant leader. I need to know that you, your, your goal is not just you. It's got to be about us. And I'm, I'm telling you, that's important. That's a big thing for me. Number four, you ready? I always pray and ask God for guidance. When I'm getting ready to vote, I pray and I ask God for guidance. But I always name the animals just like Adam and Eve, Adam did. There's a verse in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. I want to read it to you. This is a great verse. Here's what it says. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man and to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Whatever the man called them, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the, in the sky and all the wild animals. So God told Adam, you name it. He said, Adam, I'm going to give you some time here. You name the animals. I'm not naming them. You do it. When you pray about things, God will look at you and say, OK, now what, you, what do you want to do? You get to name it. I'm not going to tell you. You know, all these people who act like God tells them how to do everything. God said, turn left. And then God said, turn right. Then God said, sit down. And God said, cut on the TV. Then God said, listen, stop all, all this. They're making that all that up. That's not that's not how it works. That, that some of that's just just emotionalism. They just I, I understand it mean well, but that's not how that's not what the Bible describes God, how God relates to us. He gives us guidelines and principles. He gave us a book for a reason. He wanted you to study to show yourself approved. He didn't want you to go around living on these voices all the time because some stuff you're making up on your own. The Bible said they prophesy out of their own hearts and their own desires. You can begin to prophesy out of your own mind, make up stuff. The Lord said, you my husband. Yes, you are. I could tell because the Lord, I told the Lord, the next man to come through the door, let him be the one. Well, see, you made all that up. All oh, that's you. So understand that there's a there's a certain degree of independence. He wants us to use our brain. So you look at the facts, you weigh things out, you count the costs up and then you make a decision. And then you then you can't say that that's the decision everybody else has to make. That's a guideline. Now, there's some tough issues on this on in this in this environment that I want to quickly mention. For example, abortion is a big issue. Gay rights is a big issue. Um, bearing arms is a big issue. Legally, legalizing drugs is a big issue. And in the environment is a big issue. Now, let me give you a couple of thoughts about each of those for a minute. When it comes to abortion, uh, man, I, um, that needs to have its own sermon. I, I am, 
I wish, here's what I wish. I wish there never had been an abortion. I wish all babies had been born. I wish that there was never any reason to even consider an abortion. I wish that was, I wish that was never on the, on, in the planet. That's my wish, but it's not true. I live in a world that I don't control. And I don't have to approve of things, but I have to manage them. And so here's the deal. Abortion to me um, has all these rules. I listen to all these exceptions, you know, well, in case the baby, you know, is going to harm the mother or in case there's incest or this, that, the other. And I, I think those are valid conversations to have. And here's what, I, here's what I want to surprise you. I don't know that I'm qualified to always have that conversation. I don't know that I know enough of the facts. If the mother's life is at risk. I, OK, who should make that decision? The doctor and her or me, the preacher or the community or who should make that decision? I mean, I'm just saying it, it, these are hard moments. Here's what I think Christians are not prepared for. They're not prepared for conversations outside of their religious bubble. The, 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 the person who's the governor, the mayor, the, the judge, the, the individual who's in government, that person has to make decisions outside of a religious bubble. They're not going to use the Bible to make the decision. They, they got to make a decision that's just that's outside of the bubble. And I think sometimes we don't have the capacity to do that. So when you get to this conversation, first of all, we don't understand the history of it. I had never read a book about it. Have you? I had never done much research. I just listened to Christians. I never studied anything. I want all babies born. I got that. You grip me? Hang with me, people. I'm just simply saying our ignorance is amazing. Some of the good guidelines and rules were so unclear and Christians are jumping in and don't even really know what they're saying about what or how it started or anything. Take a deep breath. Abortion has been around a long time and there are so many people who are watching me who've had them who are out there in church. And you know the pain and the heartache of that. And the last thing you need me to do is beat you up. You need me to love you. Help you find a way. And to find a way to help women who are in these moments find a better answer, to find an answer, especially minority women, because you are the greatest victims of this. The percentage of women of color who have abortions is way surpassing that of women who are not of color. It breaks my heart. But here's what I think the big problem is. We fight so much, we don't try to help anybody. And we're not going to try to help anybody. So you're not giving me my answer. Well, here's my answer. We need to band together and not pound on people who won't agree with us. And I want to say this, too. I don't just want to talk about aborting babies. I want to talk about aborting teenagers. I want to talk about aborting people of all ages. I want to talk about us understanding that the biggest problem is it's a sign that we have as a society have abandoned people. And that's the biggest crime. The abortion rate has climbed higher when there's poor health care. It's climbed higher when there's no family support. It's climbed higher when women are by themselves. It's climbed higher when we tell them in a video to have sex and to roll around all they want. And then when they get pregnant, we abandon them. When you guys see a woman and you want to be with her, I almost said something wrong. When you want to be with her and, and you want a moment, but you don't want the rest of what comes with that. So they make decisions in desperation that they wouldn't make if you were there. So the bigger issue is not just what you think is a political issue because the politics hasn't signed it. As a matter of fact, I want to put something on the screen right now. I want you to go listen to this video, this video that I found the other day. It's an amazing video. And in this video, it has it right there on the screen. And you can find this video on my website. Uh, and I'm, I'm really committed. As a matter of fact, let me give you a little clue. There's a place called RickyTemple.com. You ready? RickyTemple.com. OK. And in RickyTemple.com, there's articles. So if you go to RickyTemple.com articles, you got that? RickyTemple.com articles. And if you go there under articles, there's an area called abortion. I alphabetize all these articles that I read. I don't agree with all of them, but I list them. So it's going to be there forever. So under abortion, there's a video there. And that video will talk about abortion. And one of them, and I'll say special video, I'll put a name by it. So you can go see it. Ricky Temple Articles. Google that. Ricky Temple Articles. Look under abortions and you'll see the special video on abortion. And that will give you a clue. You can go there and find it. It's also going to be on Facebook. It's going to be on a number of different uh, tools that we have. 
And the goal of that video is to just explain another side to abortion. And it's interesting. It's an interesting discussion. Christians, you'll really enjoy it. So go check it out. Now, let me get back to the rest of this. Number two, gay rights. How, how I engage people. How do I engage people who have same sex appetites? What do you do? I don't know that we know how to deal with that, honestly. I think Christians are just so incredibly dishonest about that. You got people that you know, your cousin, your nephew, your friend. Uh, some of you have been through that journey and you, act like you don't have any clue. Here's what you need to do. Love people and move forward. You, but you don't get to control. We don't get to control everybody. We don't get to dominate everybody. I can't make a guy not be to be straight if he wants to be gay. And I have to love him. I work with him. He's my boss. He's my neighbor. He may be my employee. And, and churches sometimes, the way we communicate, we act like we have no formula for dealing with people. Remember the whole sermon? How am I going to engage people who are different than me? How am I going to love people who are different than me? That's the whole sermon. Third, th- third area, bearing arms. Does my right to carry a gun uh, have boundaries? Hopefully, maybe we can look at that if we band together again. This whole conversation, we can't make sense. So we can't even talk about it. Bearing arms is something we should be able to talk about. We should find boundaries. Should, should there be boundaries? We should be able to talk about that. Fourthly, legalize drugs. What's the best plan for this whole issue where we don't entrap people and get more people addicted? There's something really dangerous about this whole attitude. The, the, the season of prohibition in America was in 1920 to 1933. I want to put something on the screen. I want you to see this. This is interesting, this prohibition period. Prohibition era, 1920 to 1933, made the manufacturing, sale, and transport of alcohol illegal in the United States, according to the 18th Amendment. So it was this whole plan to stop people from drinking, and it didn't work. So we've got to find a way to get this to work. I don't want to legalize anything. I don't want to drink anything. Let me tell you something. I don't drink because I like it. I'm telling you now. I've seen it in my family. It ain't good for me. I ain't drinking nothing. I ain't smoking nothing either. I, don't, I can't, can't, can't smoke anything. That didn't work. I smoked one time. I was a teenager. They said, Temple, we were walking down the street. Said, Temple, you, have, you smoke? I said, I, I lied. I said, oh, yes, I was a teenager. I said, sure, I, of course I smoke. And they gave it to me. And I, I did that. That was it. That was my whole drug career right there. Bam. <laughs> no more drugs. That was it. I tried smoking one time in the movies and I got sick as a dog. Oh, my God. I never want to do that again. So I just wasn't good at all that. Some of you are professionals. You're good enough for me and you. But my point is, we got to talk about it in a way that, that doesn't entrap people. And we got to have big, more conversations. But see, this is not a church conversation because church people have in, out, holy, unholy, saved, unsaved, heaven, hell. Everything is one, two, three. It doesn't you know, matter three. It's one and two. And so we tend to not be able to embrace conversations with people. We're not good at that. Not at all. People that are different. And then lastly, environment. <laughs> you know, God told Adam, you know, this is the world. You need, you need to take care of it. This is the garden I'm putting you in. From the very beginning, God said you need to be an environmentalist. Care about the planet. It's your garden, sir. You mess it up, you're in trouble. I talked about a lot today. I did. And I said it the best way I could. If it wasn't perfect, love me, I tried. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray with me. Next week, I'm going to turn to another subject. I'm going to talk about learn to live with just me. Learning how to manage isolation. Learning how to deal with moments when it's difficult. I want to take you on a journey. And I, I, want you to, I want you to think about this. Can you work with less than you plan for and be okay? When it's just you, that's next week. But this week, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would help you help you make a decision right now. Some of you feel isolated. I'll talk about more of that next week. Some of you feel pressured. All the things we talked about, the voting season has made you feel this way. I'm going to show you how to climb out of that, especially in this pandemic, how to deal with that whole feeling of isolation and loneliness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who've listened today. And I pray these words have spoken to them and given them health and wholeness. I pray that it has broken through and given them vision and strength. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for your healing touch. I pray, God, that your spirit would bring grace and healing to them. May they rise up and say, I get it in Jesus name. May they become different and never be the same. Before I close the prayer, let me ask this. Some of you would say, Pastor, what I need is to start with Jesus today. What you said really spoke to me on a lot of levels. But could you just pray for me? My walk with God is what I need. 
Pastor, the time is winding down and I need to get my life right with God. If that's you, I want you simply to do this. I want you to, to tune in today and, and raise your hand right there on the screen and say, I, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to start a walk with the living God. I realize that I need him in my life. And I want you to pray for me right there on your device. Some of you, there's a hand you can raise that would say, yes, that's me, Pastor. And some of you can type it in the chat. Yeah, pray for me, Pastor. It's your walk with God. Let me pray. Father, let this be the breaking breakthrough moment for them where they would give their life to Jesus and say, I need you in my life. I surrender my life to you and I give you the praise for them. May this life moment be a moment of change in Jesus name. Amen. Well, we covered a lot today. Yes, we did. And for some of you, you're not pleased because I didn't say everything you wanted me to say. But that's okay because we're talking about living and loving people who disagree with you. And I want to say this to you. I don't believe we ever should take the position that God gave us the answer for everybody. Jesus said he's the answer, not us. And our interpretation is not the answer. And how we apply things doesn't make it right. We have to learn to embrace truth. There are a lot of good people who are watching me today. You've made some decisions, abortion decisions, and those decisions don't make everybody happy and they don't even make you happy. The last thing you need me to do is to judge you and to give you some lifelong guilt. For those of you that have struggled with same sex issues, there's no way that I have the right to judge you and make you feel like God doesn't love you, God loves you. I have a certain conviction, but that doesn't mean that you can't be loved and accepted. Thirdly, there are people who have all kinds of views about bearing arms. Their thoughts about guns are, I need a weapon, Pastor Rick, I need a gun. Well, okay, if you need a gun, you need a gun. I'm not against bearing arms. I, I think in, in a responsible way, bearing arms can have a great value in our culture. I also talked about legalizing drugs. Legalizing drugs is a tough, tough topic for anybody. You know, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't, look, I don't take anything. I don't want to take hardly an aspirin. I am just, uh, now I do my, don't mind medication, but I <laughs> prescribe and healthy medication. And I like natural stuff the best. But I, I do feel that this whole subject of legalizing drugs is, is one that we need to pay close attention to because there are a lot of people that are for it and they're not responsible in that approach. And I, I'm concerned about it because I think the way it's approached by a lot of people isn't healthy. And a lot of places that have legalized drugs have not done their, their communities any, any justice. But I also think there's a part of, that we play when we engage people with conversation where we listen and we learn and we try to help people. I think one of the, the last things I said to you was we talked about the importance of the environment. We live in the earth, we live on the planet. You can't ignore the fact that this is our planet. Now, those are real issues. Now, you may have all kinds of views about them. And let's say you totally disagree with me. It's okay, I love you. That's all I want you to do for me, love me. Pray for me and love me, and guess what? Love your neighbor. We will never do anything well in this world if we're divided. A house, a country, divided, can't stand. That doesn't mean that we try to browbeat each other into believing everything. One of the good things about America is you get to vote. You get to say what you think in an election. You get to say what you think in ways that other countries, they only force you to do it with a gun. So I pray we never go back to those days. I pray that we love each other forward and find a way to make it all work together. Bipartisanship, love, and grace. That's what we need. I'll see you next time right here with me, Pastor Rick. I love you. Keep on loving me now. Don't you let anything change that because I love you. Bye-bye. You be blessed.